All right. We're at 901. Let's do it. What does Max say? (laughs) At Agile Austin, we start on time and we end on time. So, all right. Welcome, everyone. Let me make sure I've got this up here and you can see me. All right. So, welcome to the 2021 Keep uh, Austin Agile Conference. Our theme this year, which is new for us, is Dare to be Agile. So, um, kind of exciting. Uh, All right, so what are we going to do today? We are going to hear from three amazing speakers. Ahmed is here with us on screen. John, we already see in the audience, and I think Sally will be joining us soon. Um, We also want to share that the proceeds of our tickets, um, the tickets that you bought, uh, go to two nonprofit um, organizations. So one, the Thinkery here in Austin, and then NAMI, which is a national organization for um, mental awareness, but um, the, the money being donated will go to the Central, um, the Central Texas chapter. Um, four generous sponsors, our title sponsor, WellSky, super excited. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Elias and Group, Hyperdrive, and then our sponsor giveaway is IC Agile. So woo-hoo, thank you to all of them. Um, We will have two five-minute breaks during the conference this year. That was some feedback that we received from everyone last year, which was, hey, could you give us some break time so we could refill our coffee and not miss anything? Um, So we will definitely be doing two five-minute breaks uh, to get us going today. And then finally, if you didn't have a chance to see, um, we will do a 30-minute networking lunch after the conference for anyone who is interested. That is something else that we got feedback on last year, which is just that people miss the opportunity to talk to each other and engage and um, have some conversations about what they heard or even just connecting. So we've created the space for that um, for 30 minutes after the conference. So please stick around and join us for that. All right, so I would like to just give a little overview of what um, Agile Austin is all about, since we are um, the the group that is putting on the uh, CAW conference that we love so much. So just at a high level, if you weren't aware, um, Agile Austin is a 501c6 nonprofit organization. Um, We connect, our mission is to connect people and foster professional growth through collaborative events, which educate our community on uncovering better ways to deliver value through agile values, principles, and practices. Um, And if if you're familiar with our old website or our old, um, I'm gonna move this in front of me so you can, I'm not looking to the side. Um, If you uh, haven't seen our website in a while, all of these images, Um, are new as part of our new branding. So we're pretty excited about it. It has connections to the manifesto, um, the the, the four values and 12 principles. So it's kind of fun. Um, If you're interested in being a sponsor of Agile Austin, um, and if you're interested in being a member, you didn't already sign up and now you're thinking maybe I should, um, you can do all of that on our website. So www.agileaustin.org. Um, always looking for both sponsors and men- uh, members. So please join us. We've added in a membership portal um, where there's kind of more conversation, things about training, et cetera, going on. So kind of a space for you to drive um, the topics that you're most interested in. So please consider joining us. Um, our 2021 and 2022 board members are shown here. Um, we have several in um, attendance today. So thank you to all of our board members. Um, with Max, uh, you'll hear from him a little later as our president. Um, one thing I do want to share is we, we respond to your emails. So if you've got any questions or any feedback about things that you'd like to see happening at Agile Austin, please email us. Um, board at agileaustin.org, you will actually get a response. Um, We appreciate that so much. Um, And just to confirm, can you still see my slides? We can see the sponsorship slide. Okay. But not the... No. Nope. Do you have two showing... I do. Uh, let's try that again. Oh, there. Better? Yep. Yes. I, see, I see Max. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I just realized that. I was like, I'm not seeing the green box. So you know what? I'll just look to the side. No one will mind. My side used my better view. Um, okay. 
So uh, last couple things, and that is we are a really active community here. So um, if you have not had a chance to attend one of our special interest groups, that's our SIGs, um, they meet every month. So we've got groups such as the Agile Coaching Group, uh, Lean and Kanban, Agile at Scale, the Leadership SIG. All of this information about when, when the events take place can be found on our Meetup page which you can see here, and you can also link to it from our website. Uh, please join us for our SIGs or our monthly feature speaker series. We'd love to see you there. And then, okay, so kicking off the conference, woohoo! Um, we did a giveaway on, um, on LinkedIn, if you saw it. We, um, we did get several responses, which we are super grateful for. Um, and our winner, uh, whoop, where's my list? There it is. Somewhere in here, there it is. Okay, our winner for the first giveaway, which is a seat at an upcoming CSM or CSPO course um, given by Hyperdrive, it's your choice, will go to Lonnie Dame. Um, she wrote that she's looking forward to hearing stories about what folks have um, tried to bring Agile as a core part of their organization culture. Um, and she's also excited to see the Agile community, even if it's virtual. So congratulations, Lonnie, you are our winner. I knew that was gonna happen. And I will uh, reach out to you directly to get your information so that we can get you that seat. Okay. One last thing and then I'll go on mute. I apologize for the dog. And that is three amazing speakers. <laughs> ah, starting with Ahmed. Can, um, is, it, is it too loud, Cassandra? <laughs> I can hear you, Carrie, but I'm happy to also uh, pick up if you'd like. <laughs> Sorry, Ackman. I am going to uh, do my best to intro you while my dog is barking and sharing his um, excitement to hear you speak as well. So um, super excited to introduce you to our first speaker, Ahmed Siki. Ahmed is the president of IC Agile the head of business agility at Riot Games and the co-founder of BAI, BAI, which is the Business Agility Institute. Um, one of the things that I loved finding out about you, Ahmed, is that your business acumen began at a very young age. So at 12, he started his first business selling rice to his neighbors in his hometown of Cairo, Egypt. And then two years later, started another business importing games and selling them out of two kiosks. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much the only two malls we had back in Egypt back then, yeah. <laughs> nice. And the other thing I thought um, was pretty cool I wanted to share was just that you worked at your dad's software company. Yes. And something that you shared is that um, it runs, it ran a little more like a factory. And so that was kind of your entry into the space of lean process, lean management, um, and kind of began that passion um, for you, I think, in that uh -huh. Yeah. So um, Ahmed co-founded IC Agile with Alistair Copern in 2010, joined Riot Games in 2013, and co-founded the Business Agility Institute with Evan Laybourne in 2017. And that makes me exhausted just to say all that. Um, so super impressive, very exciting. Um, and on a personal note, I just, I would, I would say I'm super grateful for the pioneer work you've done in Agile coaching because the ACC course is one of those courses that for me personally has really changed my life um, and my profession. So I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The last thing I'll share is what your team said about you. Are you wondering? Are you wondering? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little said, worried. <laughs> <laughs> no. Your team said they you always want to include Ahmed in your dinner events because your <laughs> hospitality, you're so welcoming, and your love of food will always ensure everyone leaves with full bellies and full hearts. Very true. Oh. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, Ackman. We're so delighted. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Um, I'll stop sharing here so you can. I will do that. Uh, all right. Let's start here. So let's see where everyone is now. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, morning, Austin, and I guess everywhere else in the world. I love these. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Keep Austin Agile, for having me. Thank you, Carrie, for the amazing introduction. Um, let's go right into it. We're going to talk about the journey of business agility. Um, and when we talk about sort of um, daring to dream and, and daring to go beyond agile, 
Uh, one of the things I want to invite you all to think about today is the journey, not just of agile, but business agility. And what is it? And what could your journey look like? Um, and so I want to start with the definition here real quickly. Uh, let's get the boring part out of the way, right? Definitions. But what is business agility? Business agility is basically a set of organizational capabilities, behaviors, and ways of working that affords your business freedom, flexibility, and resilience to achieve its purpose no matter what the future brings. Now, a lot of words there. I actually won't go into the detail. I'm going to give you sort of like just five seconds to absorb that. But the key points here is business agility is not a process. It's a set of capabilities, behaviors, and ways of working. What does it give you? It gives you freedom, flexibility to do what? To achieve your purpose. Hopefully that purpose is customer centricity. It's related to your customer. But the key here is no matter what the future brings to you, you'll be able to deliver on that mission, that purpose, because you have that agility. Now, I'm a visual guy, so I don't know about you guys, but I, you know what picture actually comes to mind when you think of agility, right? And I wanna show you a video, and this is one of my favorite videos. When I think of agility, here's sort of what comes to, like the visual that comes to mind. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of parkour or not, but uh, let's, set, let's take a look. So uh, I share, all right, let's see if this is gonna work. So that's when, when I think of agility, that's the picture that sort of comes to my mind, right? It's um, this no constraints, uh, it doesn't matter what obstacle, yeah, that was my last weekend, exactly. I am not that agile myself, <laughs> physically, uh, but um, really when you think of what is business agility, for me, it's that visual, right? It's your customer is in constant motion. And do you have enough agility to let alone just run after them, but actually be ahead of them, right? Um, and, and deliver on something they've never dreamed of, right? And so it's that, you know, whatever obstacles come your way, you have the flexibility, the freedom, the flexibility, the resilience to get back up and do it again so that you can deliver value to your customer. That's the visual that comes to my mind. And I, I love metaphors. And so in general, whether you consider parkour a sport or not, uh, I think there's a lot of similarities between thinking about business agility as a sport um, because sports are open to everyone, every company can have agility, really. It doesn't matter what age the company is, how big, how small, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you put the effort, the discipline, the journey, um, the grind day in and day out to build that agility. Uh, but a lot of organizations just want it to come down and it's like, okay, I wanna be an athlete, make me into an athlete. Uh, well, no one's gonna make you into an athlete. There's, there's hard work, right? And there's like just it's a it's a it's a deliberate effort towards mastery. Um, uh, there's a lot of discipline, a lot of hard work. And what I love about it is everyone has a little bit, right? Every organization has some agility, or else they probably wouldn't have survived. The question is, do you have enough agility for what you're trying to do or not? The other, I think, really important part of the 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 how agility looks like sports for me is. If you stop working on it, you lose it. It's not something that's guaranteed. It's not something that you have for life. The, the most athletic athletes, and, and, and if they stop and start you know, overeating and not working out and doing this and doing that, guess what? It's, <laughs> they're not going to have the same athletic ability. Same things with organization. You can have a, you know, an organization that, that's really demonstrating a ton of agility 
and you know, innovating and seizing opportunities and delighting their customers. And then, you know, there's a change of leadership and things don't go as the same. And that's that's okay, right? But it's it's really those ups and downs um, that I want to like. You don't have it always. It's not guaranteed. You're not entitled for it. If you're a startup or a big organization, or if you have coaches, or if you have money, or if you have framework, no. It really is about deliberate effort. What I want to do before we talk about the journey to increase our business agility is to really just show what business agility looks like. Um, A lot of people sort of know maybe what agile looks like, they're living it. Um, But what does business agility look like? Is it just more teams? Is my executive team doing daily stand-ups now? Like, what, what, what does it really look like? And here I'm going to lean on the domains of business agility by the Business Agility Institute. And I want to just tell you the story, right? This, for me, draws the picture. And the picture really starts right in the middle, right, with customer centricity. A, a organization that has a lot of business agility that that has developed its business agility, there's a purpose. There's something about serving an underserved customer. There's a mission. There's an insurgency there that I'm going to fight on behalf of a customer. And in that middle, right, I hire people that are very passionate and aligned about my mission. I don't just go hire anyone with the skills. No, no culture fit, mission alignment, passionate, empowered people are the kind of people that I hire. I also make sure that whatever governance body I have, a board, a board of trustees, whatever your organization is, they're also aligned that we're going to take the long term, the customer centric term, the the, the customer centric angle, right? We're going to sometimes trade off the, the the short-term gains to gains to do something that's going to be awesome for our customer long term. And we also really select our partners, right? Because if we just select partners that are transactional, then our customers will feel that transactional nature. They won't feel the love. They won't feel the customer centricity. So we actually really cultivate a relationship with our partners so that we can be customer centric, right? Also, if you take a look at another vignette of an organization that has business agility, their leadership are really focused on people management. They understand that people are the greatest source of agility in an organization. I want to repeat that again. People are the greatest source of agility in an organization. It doesn't matter if you have the most agile process, the most agile framework. It doesn't matter. If people aren't agile, you're not agile as an organization. And by the way, if you have the most ridiculous process and you have the most agile people, guess what's going to happen? They're going to deliver value. The most agile part of an organization is the people. So leaders focus on people. They focus on nurturing them, on enabling them, on empowering them, on supporting them. That's the vignette I want you to see. That's what leadership is focused on, right? Versus micromanagement. Leadership acts as one team. They're not siloed. They're not working in kingdoms. They're not trying to build their little silo or domain. No, it's all about us as one team, all the way at the sea level, all the way down within the organization so that when we need to move as an organization, we all move as one organism, not many different organisms. Leadership is focused on strategic agility. They're focusing on setting big, inspiring visions and strategies that have space, that are generative, that allow people not just to, oh, here's what I need to do, let me go do it. No, that give speed, give people space to innovate and to really identify opportunities to execute this strategy in unforeseen ways. They have space. In an agile organization, another vignette is how they operate. That one in the middle process agility, that's where a lot of us sort of We've seen that movie before. We've seen those pictures before, right? It's 
you know, how we deliver value, how we operate using agile, continuous improvement, all of those great things. That's process agility. That's just one out of all these sort of vignettes. Enterprise agility, HR, finance, legal, sales, like everything that supports the organization's operations. Are they agile? Are they there with a mindset to enable the organization to deliver value or are they sort of the police trying to hinder it, right? Do you try to think of, oh my God, how do I get around the performance review or the performance management or the budget cycle? Or do you view those as these things are actually gonna enable me to do uh, and to deliver value more to my customer. That's, that's what I talk about when I say enterprise agility, right? Structural agility, right? Do you have the agility necessary to bring people together to create coalitions? Yeah, you can get these slides, don't worry about it. Um, right? To bring these coalitions together, to bring people together and then to not bring them together, but, you know, or is any, every one of these like a big org change and like a lot of drama and you're taking my people, don't touch my people, what am I going to do with my kingdom? All of those kind of things. So again, another vignette here, right? Individuals, when you look inside of an agile organization, an organization that has true business agility, a lot of business agility, you'll find people with a growth mindset, people that are willing to learn and try new things and experiment. They're not afraid to make mistakes. They're, I mean, they're not intentionally trying to make mistakes too. A lot of people go all the way to the extremes like, we want to encourage mistakes. I, I don't want to encourage mistakes, right? But if they happen on a path of innovation and growth and trying things out, great, it's okay. We live and learn, right? Um, but it, that fear of failure, that fear of speaking up is not there, right? Why? Because they have an ownership and accountability mentality. They feel that they own, right, decisions. Decisions are actually pushed down to the lowest level in the organization, right? And they have a customer-centric view. They have the space to make decisions. And they are many times the closest people to the customer to know what they need to do. But with great power comes great accountability. So that balance is there in the organization. And we know what we're doing, craft excellence. We've invested in building our craft, right? Maybe something that is not just directly related to the task I'm doing, I brought in. Why? So that when I need to do something that is new, I actually have the know-how to do it, right? Craft excellence and investing in education and learning. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a picture of business agility. Right? I hope you were able just to see what an agile organization. I didn't mention two week iterations. I didn't mention stickies. I didn't mention stand ups. I didn't mention release trains or release buses or you know boats or you know. I didn't mention any of those. Why? Because you can have none of those and be the most agile organization if you have these things, and you can have all of those and be very, very not agile, right? So this, from my point of view, is business agility. Now, tell me a little more. Well, the reality is when you zoom in, there's observable behaviors, right? You can actually start to see, <laughs> uh, you can actually start to see some behaviors that demonstrate all these things that we talk about. And this is, you guys are getting a, a sneak preview, right? So um, Austin plus plus, <laughs> whoever's watching, um, you guys get a sneak preview of some of the work the Business Agility Institute is doing. Um, they've identified 80 something behaviors that really, and this is through a, a ton of research that truly show observable behaviors, right? And again, if you take a read at these, like, I think the word agile is mentioned once in these, right? I, I, the reason is these are observable behaviors of agility, of everything we just talked about. But one thing I want you to notice before I zoom in a little bit, look at the portion of behaviors related to leaders. Over 50% of these behaviors 
are related to leaders. And if you add executives, that gives us two thirds of the behaviors. So maybe we'll get this question or not. I don't know. How do I start an agile business agility? Like it's, we got to get leaders on board, right? I mean, we can show, you know, glimpses of light within an organization through teams and whatnot. But if you want true business agility across the organization, right, in its DNA, look, just look at these behaviors. And by the way, good news and bad news. Bad news, I'll start with the bad news. Leaders don't like changing behaviors a lot. The good news is when they do, the impact is massive. The impact is massive. So if you just take a look here, right? I mean, again, we haven't published this yet. So you guys are getting the sneak preview, right? But prioritize, you know, uh, uh, where openly shares information, optimizes the flow of work, encourage teams to take risks, develop accountability in people. Just start to imagine what this looks like. So I want to go back to my sports metaphor for a second before we continue here, right? So, all right. You sold me. I want this business agility, right? I want, I want more of this agility. How do I get it? Well, you know, as a lot of people start, you know, maybe coming out of the pandemic or whatnot, like, okay, I need to shed some pounds. I need to get more fit. Uh, some people went, you know, anyways, but um, I'm one of them. Um, so the point is, one of the things that you start to do is like, okay, let's take a look at my, you know, body fat, you know, muscle, you know, mass, all that kind of stuff. So I want to show you, this is the sneak, again, more sneak previews here. You guys are getting a lot. Uh, love you, Austin. Uh, plus, plus. Um, business agility profile. It is a way of really looking at what, where are we on this business agility journey? What do we have? What do we not have? And so, each one of those observable behaviors I just talked to you about, right, will ask those to a person and they will agree or disagree. And depending on the amount of agreement or disagreement, right, um, with these behaviors, with the fact that they're actually seeing these behaviors. Now, I want you to think about this, right? These aren't, what do you think of Scrum, good or bad, right? Um, no, these are observable behaviors. Do you see this happening? And we actually triangulate the, the question. So, um, I, you know, ask a leader, uh, do you empower people? Ask the employee, are you empowered, right? And we triangulate. But anyway, long story short, uh, I would just want you to get the point here of this word. Strength of business agility basically is an aggregate of the results, sort of, and, and you can see sort of that, that red amount, that's the amount of agility, right, for that individual based on their answers. Let me plot that against the curve here, right? So on the right-hand side, those who have a lot of agility, left-hand side, those who don't yet. Again, you can add, you can delete, it, you know, depends on the effort you put. And then we start plotting. Well, how many people in the organization said that they have none versus a lot? And that creates a curve. And this is how the curve looks. So when I see a curve like this, it means that there's a lot of people in the organization that have very little or have observed very little business agility capability and behaviors across the organization. The opposite would look something like this. A lot of people observed a lot of behaviors that are related to business agility. So my curve would look like this. Cool? We're good? I'm gonna take this step by step here. Now, here's the interesting part. The research also showed that really it's not just the spectrum. The zero line is not on the left. It's actually right in the middle. Why? Because it's not that you just have it or don't have it. it, actually creates energy, it creates pull and push, right? So if I have a lot of people in the organization that are demonstrating, that are behaving in non-agile ways, it actually pulls agility backwards. And if I have a lot of people demonstrating and behaving in ways that are agile, quote unquote, it actually pushes agility forward. And so when I look at a picture like this, 
this actually is saying sort of we're pulling the organization backwards. Like those trying to do agile, good luck to them, right? Because they're going against the center of gravity here. Feels like you, it's okay. We'll get better. There's hope. On the other side, there's like, you better get on this train of agility or else you're going to feel like left out, right? Or, and momentum, exactly. Thank you, right? It pushes agility forward. Now, I want you to see something here that I believe is one of the most dangerous profiles to this. It's where actually a lot of organizations are. You have some agility. You have some behaviors. You have some people that like it, some people that don't. It's this amazing tug of war, right? It's like pull, push, pull, push. Where are we? And we actually stagnate. Our agility journey stagnates. Why? Because this is actually quite dangerous. Because it feels agile, but we're actually not. When we look there's spots of agility, so it's good. But actually, it's just this vicious back and forth Squid Games. <laughs> I knew there was going to be a reference to Squid Games today. Um, this vicious back and forth, right? Now, let me get into a little more insight here. So one of the most important things we found was the 0 0.6 mark. So the 0 0.6 mark, beyond that, we found that Agility was more established. These behaviors weren't transient. It wasn't, you know, these, these habits have been established. And between the zero and the 0 0.6, it was actually more inconsistent, right? It's like, ah, you know, my boss allows it, my boss doesn't. I change bosses, I change leaders, so forth. Reminds us of NPS, Net Promoter Score. In a net promoter score, those who don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a, anyway, I'm not going to, I don't have time to get into MBS. But um, the, the, the key thing here is out of a scale from one to 10, when I ask you how likely are you to recommend the product, the service, et cetera, the way it's calculated, only the nines and tens matter, actually, right? The seven and eights are actually considered passive or neutral because it could go either way. Like really one bad interaction, one bad leader, right? One bad request could push me right back to non-agile world, right? Or less agility. And then we have our detractors, right? And what that led to is some very interesting organizational profiles that we started to see, right? So A, actually, let's start with B. Let's start with B for a second. So bottom left, that's a government agency. That's a real government agency. <laughs> like that looks like a government agency. That feels like a government agency. We're good to go there. If this was a private company, I would tell them, beware of disruption. Something's going to come your way really soon, right? And then let's take the, 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 the sort of the opposite D for a second, right? There, see that, that, that blue, the blue shaded area? That's 50% of the organization. That's 50% of the, the results of the profile of the organization. So that median, that black line is what we look at. That black line is past the 0 0.6 mark. I'd say, hey, enjoy your agility. Like it's part of your DNA. If you have a new leader that comes in that totally wants to kill this agility, they'll actually have to transform the company to a non-agile organization, right? Because the natural DNA of the organization right now is that it's agile, okay? Let's go back up to C for a second. C is good job, but you're not safe yet, right? So you could actually slip, right? You could get a new CEO, a new something. It's not yet in the DNA. You haven't reached a new status quo. It's not organizational habits or, or, or DNA, I guess, um, these behaviors yet. You're changing. Then we have A. A is like, we did a little bit of Agile. Look at us. Some of us are here. Some of us are there. We're in that like tug of war. They will probably... Um, stagnate for a bit. 
they will go through some real pain. And I'll go, actually, let me, let me get into this. Um, let me, let me, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this, but we'll go into this in a little more detail. So, so sustainable organizational agility, we really need a comprehensive culture transformation, right? We need to change the culture of the organization. Uh, I've had this model for years. Um, how do you visualize culture, right? What is culture? It's the sum total of leadership, strategy, structure, people, and process. And um, culture really is, I want you to imagine, I had a rubber band around here. I don't know where it is. Uh, you know what? Here, let me just use my hair um, thing. All right. So, um, so this, right? Do I still look good on camera? Okay, it's okay. Um, so this, this is culture. I hope, yeah, you guys can see this, right? This is culture. It's shaped by the elements inside of it, right? How leadership, their values, their strategy, how we make, you know, how do we set goals? Is it goals as a company or goals as a every kingdom, every silo by themselves? All that sets the culture of the organization. Now, interestingly, this rubber band does two functions. It shows sort of what the shape of the culture is, but it also puts tension. It keeps the organization in check. So when we try to change one element of our culture, like just process, we're actually not changing the culture. We're straining the culture. We're putting tension on the culture. And guess what happens? When you put that tension, as soon as your sponsor of change um, moves away, guess what's going to happen? What's that culture going to do? What's the rubber band going to do? It's going to push things right back to the way the, they are. Sounds familiar? Now, in my journey, I have seen a number of common transformation approaches. I want to walk you guys through them, and we'll see them from the eyes of the profile as well. So the first one I call, so we're, what are we trying to do? So visually, this is very hard for me to show visually, so bear with me here, right? So from an industrial age sort of, you know, 20th century, how to run a company, mindset and culture to a knowledge age, 21st century, mindset and culture, right? So the first way I've seen this done is what I call the process-led transformation, or let me know when you're done, all right? So the way this one works looks like this. So basically, we start with an organization that's blue. We want to get it to green. So again, just representative here. So we change process. We're going to push that process wedge. Why? Because Agile is a process, right? No, it's not. But anyway, all right? They boil Agile down to process. Let's just, you know, change our two-week iterations or whatever, right? So we just change process. And the hope, the dream, the aspiration here is that this change will actually generate more change. And we'll start to change how people think and structure and strategy and, and notice leadership hasn't moved, huh? Notice leadership hasn't moved. And I didn't mean leadership at the top because the top of the pyramid or whatnot. I just needed some visualization. All models are flawed, but I just need it. Like the number of leaders to the number of people are very small. And by the way, leaders do shape the organization more than a lot of other things. So anyway, not trying to say top-down hierarchy or anything, but we just live with the, the model. Um, and again, the hope, the aspiration here is that this will all move us to this new great organization of the future that is agile. I've never seen this work, ever. Here's what I've seen. Here's what I've seen. And I'm going to show it to you with a profile right now. I've seen this. The organization starts. They change process. They get significant gains. But look at where center of mass is still. All right. Then they still get more gains, by the way. Because change at the beginning, you know, that J curve, there's, there's some hype at the beginning. So we get more. But here's what happens. We start to stagnate, actually. Why? Because we have a process that's collaborative and reward systems that aren't. We have a process that it wants space for facilitation and innovation and leaders that don't allow it because they want everything crunch, crunch, crunch. We have behaviors. We have that tug of war, right? We go back 
and forth, back and forth. And what happens is we get bored. People actually stop and say, you know what? Look, look at what's going to happen. The rubber band's actually going to push everything into a new status quo because that's what culture does. It, will, it won't tolerate that flat shape, like this flat shape. A, a, a decent culture, a decent culture won't tolerate this. this you're at too, there's too much tension in the culture. So what's going to happen is we're just going to norm. The people that were too agile will like dial it down a bit, right? The people that weren't are going to, you know, okay, let, let's reach this sort of compromise in the middle. And then, by the way, we call this done. That was, whew, that was a rough agile transformation. Great job. We're done with our agile transformation. Please dismantle the team, fire the coaches. We're good to go, right? Um, and by the way, did they change? 100%, right? They moved from the 0 0.4 or 5 mark to, to the 0 mark. Great job. I, I'm not saying that's bad, but did you realize all what you wanted to get out of agility? Probably not. All right, let's move on to number two. Team or org leg transformation, also known as I'm doing this with you or without you, right? And this is how this one looks. And you can look at this as a macro or micro view. So you can look at it on a team level or you can look at it as a big organization and these are small orgs within, right? So one org says, I'm done with you guys. I'm doing agile. I, like I believe in this, I'm doing it. They're at odds with the culture of the rest of the organization, by the way, right? Now, the hope, the aspiration, the dream is that we become a lighthouse and show others the right way to do it. And we bring others on this journey. And by the way, that does work at the beginning. But then you reach this phase, oh my God, where everyone's calling themselves agile, but no one knows what the hell is happening. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah? But again, the hope, the dream, the aspiration is that everyone will eventually come to the green side, to the good side. Have I seen that work? Sometimes. Depends on the level of influence that organization or that team has, right? Here's how this looks from a profile perspective. All right, we're going to move one team. We get great gains, especially if this is a big team or a big org and an influential org. And a lot of times it is, by the way. It's a good thing, right? More teams love this, and they do more of it. Look at, look at where our org is. Now, here comes the great tug of war. This is it. Everyone is, we, we actually stagnate. This approach stagnates even longer, and it just stays like this. Because by the way, everyone thinks that they're agile. Like it's a belief. The other side, the culture sort of puts us in place and we're like, okay, our process is very different than our, like, okay, let's dial in the process. Here, every org is saying, guess what? Yeah, agile fatigue. And we're like, okay, we're just gonna call ourselves all agile. Congratulations, everyone, we've done it. All right, I wanna introduce you to this. The culture-led transformation. The all for one, one for all. It builds on a really important fundamental concept, even from outside the agile world, right? When big organizations scale and transform well, they focus on moving a thousand people forward one foot at a time, rather than moving one person forward by a thousand feet. It's not about taking one pilot or two pilots and, and, and changing it. It's really looking at these behaviors. And I want you to really just try to imagine this for, for a few minutes. I know I'm I'm, I'm, uh, I'm running out of time here, so from, give me. But, but um, John, I'll take a couple of minutes from your talk. Love you, John. Um, but these are the behaviors that, that enable right, business agility. I want you to start imagining, just, just pick some. Everyone, everyone right now on the screen, pick four or five of these in your head, right? And just start to imagine if every leader, right, gives regular actionable feedback, sets clear expectations, right? What am I reading here? Reinforces positive behaviors, right? 
um, acts as a creative visionary, adjusts to organizational culture, share the rules behind salaries, right? Um, start to imagine this world and start to come on this journey with me here, right? And this is what the culture-led transformation looks like, where the whole organization, everyone in there, is adopting four or five behaviors and they move a little bit at once, right? And then more behaviors and we move a little bit more and then more behaviors and we move. But notice something, the culture is intact. The triangle is intact because when we change behaviors, right? We understand that while there is a change curve, and like when we change people's behaviors, there's going to be a change curve. You're changing people's behaviors. But we're going to take this as a continuous journey of business agility. It's a continuous journey. It's a culture of learning, actually. When you want to change behaviors at that scale, right, you're actually engaging HR, internal comms, leadership, people management. This is not about educating you know, our delivery teams on Scrum. This is about educating everyone on a different way of working, a different set of behaviors. And so your organizational profile looks like this. You just keep moving to the right as an organization together with a normal distribution curve and you just keep moving and you never stop. The question is, which behaviors do I start with, right? Of all these behaviors, what do I start? I want to go back to, to a couple of words here. Business agility is a set of organizational capabilities. And so the Business Agility Institute, part of this research also is identifying what are these capabilities? What are capabilities that organizations want? Forget agile, capabilities, depending on their strategy. And one of the most interesting, I surveyed a bunch of, senior C-level, you know, senior VP levels, the ability to cultivate a culture of learning and experimentation, that number six was the highest rated capability that they want. You know what was number two? Just to show you the world we're living in. It's not about frameworks and scrum. It was number 11. The ability to rec recruit, retain, and manage the best people for your mission. So just to show you a super quick example, because I know I'm out of time here. Right. So the ability to cultivate a culture of learning and experimentation, you start to understand, well, we need to establish these behaviors. These are the behaviors we want to see change. You start to think of that culture triangle and you ask yourself this. All right. Well, what needs to change with leadership to establish these behaviors? What needs to change with our strategy to establish these behaviors? What needs to change with our structure to establish these behaviors? That's how you're changing the entire culture. You're changing all the different dimensions of culture in alignment with the behaviors that you want to establish. And then once you're done with that, you keep adding more and more and more because it's a continuous journey, right? This is an actual picture of this roadmap that we've used. And here's actually how it looks, just so you see it again. So you add, you start to change those behaviors. It moves you a little bit. You change your behaviors again, it moves you a little more. It's a journey and it just keeps going. All right. So what do I do? Dude, that's great but I'm already in process-led transformation land. What, what do I do? It's okay. You can recover from any state that you're in, right? So if you're in process transformation land, so you're somewhere like this, right? Right now, the, the rubber band is closing in and you're starting to norm on something that's sort of in the middle. It's okay. Let it be. Focus the new organization on some key behaviors. Take a behavioral driven approach to this, right? And then make sure the desired behaviors are becoming habits. It takes time, let it be, right? And then add a few more behaviors after that and then you'll get to where you wanna go. What about if I'm team-based transformation? Same thing, don't worry about it, right? Let the tug of war play a little bit and then focus the organization on a few new key behaviors, right? Give it some time, same recipe. Give it some time to become part of the culture, right? Let it embrace, add more, and you'll become more agile. All right, I'm done, I promise, right? So the journey to business agility is a grind. 
driven by a mission that requires persistent effort over a long period of time, requires a growth mindset. It's going to trial and error. We're going to learn culture of learning and experimentation. But here's the most important thing. It has no shortcuts. It has no shortcuts. And I want to show you a video of when you tried a shortcut. Super short video. When you tried a shortcut, business agility, what it looks like. Here we go. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I hope you don't take shortcuts. Um, so sorry. So sorry to take a few extra minutes. Um, thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, before you go, um, we would. So we're all about giveaways uh, this this year because we have a giveaway sponsor. Whoop, whoop. So um, before you go, Max is going to share his screen and do the spinning wheel. Um, yes. And who, yes. and whoever, um, just for our, our audience, um, whoever's name it lands on, you will be getting a one year subscription to BAI's online library. If you're already a member of BAI and you have that, then um, we have an alternate, which is the subscription to the online, uh, not the online, the physical journal emergence, which I was meant to bring my copy, but it's awesome. Um, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, so wheel of names, and you might not notice this, but all the names of everybody here are on that wheel. Go, Max. Awesome. So we're short on time, so I don't get to do my whole 10 minute <laughs> speech as president of Agile Austin. Got it. I'm a very shy, I'm an introverted person, so that's quite <laughs> all right. Okay, folks, are you ready? Uh, as you said, it's wheel of names. All people that signed up for this are on this. I'm clicking. You've got to be here to win. Okay. You see it spinning, right? You see it's it? so yeah. tense. This is so it intense. It is going to stop on drum roll. Drum. Michelle Atkins. Is All Michelle right. here? Yeah. You, hold on. You have to chat. Is she here? Did she chat on the, on the actual thing? We want to make sure that she's here. Michelle, mm -hmm. I don't know where my chat box is. Have we heard from Michelle yet? Not, Not yet. yet. Oh my God, this but is maybe, killing me. I know. Oh. So maybe it's been one more time. Okay. And sorry, we'll, Michelle. Three, two, we'll one. Next. Spinning again. You got to be here to win, as we said. And the next one is Seth Taplin. Is Seth here? Uh, oh, oh, oh. Okay, we're, we no, less I, I've, I've done a quick search. I don't see Seth. Yeah, here. Lesson learned. We pull the names from attendees, not the report. <laughs> lesson learned. Lesson learned. Uh, in retrospect, yes, in Karen. Retrospect. <laughs> Maybe the last it's one. Okay, we live and learn. Time. We live and we learn. We live and learn. Let's Growth try one mindset. more time. If not, yes. Come on, Mortaza, is Murtaza, be there. Is Murtaza here? Yes, he is. Yay! Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> I am done. <laughs> We're learning. We're learning. Thank you for learning with us. Thank you, Max, for that. Yeah, thank Love you, the Max. energy. And Ahmed, thank you so much. Thank uh, you guys for having me. Awesome. Yeah. Loved it. All right. And um, Murtaza, we'll, we'll be pinging you on the side. And so I know we don't have time for questions, but you can go to my website, ask me questions there, ahmedsidki.com. Uh, if you want a good book, John's going to talk next, so. So his book is great. Woohoo! Awesome. Thank, Thank you. You, you got to pay me, John, for that plug in, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. All right. Good. I'm going to turn it over to um, Cassandra, who is going to introduce us to our first nonprofit. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to introduce Andy Bell here. He is here with us, and he is the CEO of The Thinkery. Andy is a STEM education advocate and thought leader who has spent his career building and leading programs that improve student outcomes through engaging and hands-on learning. Uh, prior to becoming CEO, Andy served on Thinkery's board of directors for three years. He and his family have been enthusiastic members of The Thinkery since their first daughter was born. So uh, Andy, welcome. Thank you so much for having me and uh, what a, an exciting and, and enthusiastic uh, conference to, uh, to join. This is, this is wonderful. 
Um, just want to start by saying uh, how appreciative and make sure are my uh, slides You're sharing. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. You're good. Um, just really appreciative for uh, the opportunity to share a little bit about Thinkery and what we are doing beyond our children's museum, which uh, many of you may be aware of, and for the, the support that, uh, that um, you have provided through this conference to our organization. Um, Thinkery, our mission is to create innovative learning experiences that equip and inspire the next generation of creative problem solvers. And I think if we've learned anything over the last year and a half, it's, it's the importance of inspiring that next generation of, of creative problem solvers and doing it in a fun, engaging, hands-on way. Um, when, we, uh, when we think about the world that today's kiddos are going to grow up in. I think everyone here is acutely aware that it's a, a dynamic workforce out there. And the estimates actually are that 65% of children that are entering elementary school today will ultimately work in a job that doesn't exist. And it's gonna be things like communication and collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, um, you know, everything that you're talking about, right? It's, it's that collaborative piece. It's that um, learning and being iterative as you move forward and being able to apply that skill set to a variety of different ways to become lifelong learners um, and to find the ways that we can provide opportunity for all of our children in our local community and ways that we can support that as, uh, as we move forward. Um, at Thinkery, we have a, a special emphasis on early learners, and this is critical. 90% of a, a child's brain development takes place in that first five years. But these numbers are heartbreaking here in, in the local Austin community. Only 50% of Austin's children today are kindergarten ready, and in low-income homes, that number is just 36%. And when you start out behind, your chances of catching up um, are, are really difficult. And so Thinkery has created a series of targeted programs and partnerships so that we can create the types of experiences that are inspiring for kids, that create this love and passion for learning, for exploring, for inquiry. We do that through our museum, uh, which has more than 450,000 visitors annually. Um, it is uh, the most visited cultural institution in, in Austin, um, but we really focus on creating access to those that don't have the financial means to visit. So we have more than 40,000 folks that are admitted through our Open Door program. Um, we serve Title I schools with field trips, more than 25 students coming annually. This past year, we launched a, a STEAM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math um, Preschool. And through our research partnership with UT Austin, we share out all of the educational learnings that we do here at Thinkery with others within the community so that they can integrate those into their programs. And we also partner with the local school districts and how you can take this fun, play-based, hands-on learning and bring it into your classroom so that kids aren't taught there's one right answer and you need to memorize facts. You're taught this open-ended, let's explore and let's design as, uh, as we move forward. Your support through this conference and, and support for Thinkery has gone to our Open Door Initiative, which, uh, which does reduce these financial barriers for folks to visit our museum um, it offers scholarships to our field trips. It offers scholarships to our Little Thinkers Preschool. Um, every week, uh, we have free hours, Sundays from three to five for anyone in the community to come. And this sponsors that ability um, and our community org partnerships. And so our Open Door Initiative is really how we're able to expand our access to everyone in the community. And I would be remiss if I didn't um, share opportunities for adults to play as well. And so we, we work with the kiddos, but we also have some really fun activities at night, including a birthday party that we're throwing um, called Spark After Dark. And so it's just a really fun and, and vibrant environment as we move forward. So um, really appreciative for this time and opportunity to, uh, to share what we're doing and, and for the support of Thinkery and the impact that we're making in the community 
to be able to expand these transformational, hands-on, um, inquiry-rich experiences to those in our community that have traditionally been underserved and, and underrepresented. So I uh, look forward to, uh, to, to seeing you around Thinkery and in the community in the future. So thanks so much for this time. Yeah, no, thank you, Andy. All right. I see that a couple folks here have already been part of the Thinkery, so that is awesome. And do we have any other questions, Carrie, from anyone? I was on mute. I'm not seeing any other questions. Okay. So All right. Good. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Um, all right, so then the next thing on our uh, list is just a quick um, uh, intro and a big thank you to our title sponsor, WellSky. And um, Cassandra, you are representing WellSky today. So if you wanted to share everyone a little bit about WellSky, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Cassandra Cardenas, and I'm currently Senior Manager Process and uh, Release Management over at WellSky. I started off as a Scrum Coach, and now I'm very excited for this new role. And to just kind of tell you a little bit of who we are, we are a leading technology company offering a range of software solutions, analytics, and services that help organizations optimize care and performance, achieve better outcomes, and lower costs across the care continuum. Our clients represent the most prevalent connected network across acute, post-acute, and community care. As the system of record that helps in-home and post-acute agencies provide personalized patient care to the essential systems that power the largest blood banks and social service programs, WellSky is basically connecting every part of health and community care. WellSky also equips more than 20,000 clients with the tools to thrive today and in the shift of value-based care using our intelligence care management solutions and services. Providers can seamlessly collaborate, streamline care transactions, manage risk, increase revenue, and support successful outcomes for even the most complex populations. So if y'all have any questions about WellSky, let's discuss how we can help your organiz organization succeed. Also, um, we do have several open positions for anyone who would like to apply for WellSky. Um, I'm sure some of my own peers will drop the link here of our career page. And we are currently searching a, for a staff Scrum Master role. So for any of you who have, who have experience of being a Scrum Master, I'd love to talk to you. So thank you all so much. And we are very excited to be a sponsor for today's event. Hey, thank you, Cassandra. And Andy, I think there was a question for you in chat. If you wanted to um, answer that in chat, that would be great. Because we are at the time where we're doing our five minute break. Um, so we wanna kind of keep on our schedule as we can. So I'll, um, if that's okay, Andy, and have you do chat, uh, respond in chat, if that's all right. Um, and thank you to Well Sky. Um, we will start our our. Uh, let's see if I can make this larger. I'm sure I can. We will start our five minute break now, and um, see you all back in five. All right. I uh, Jennifer Perkins, who will be joining us today in talking about Nami of Central Texas. So just to kind of give you all um, some background of Jennifer Perkins, Jennifer brings more than two decades of experience working across the public affairs spectrum, developing relationships with public, private, and nonprofit organizations in Texas, Missouri, and California. Since returning to Texas, Ms. Perkins has been elected to, to the executive committee of NAMI Central Texas Board, named Chair of Statewide Affinity Outreach for the San Diego State University, Aztecs Regional Council, and selected as a mentor with Longhorn Advocates. Jennifer earned her BA at the University of Texas and her MBA at San Diego State University. So it is with great pleasure to welcome Jennifer. You are on mute, Thanks. Jeff. 
You know there what? You I always forget that. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, don't mess that up. Um, <laughs> no worries. But there you go. Um, so thanks everybody for, uh, thanks y'all for having NAMI Central Texas to be part of your program today. We really appreciate the opportunity for some exposure. And so I'll just take a couple of quick minutes and explain the organization for those who may not be familiar. NAMI Central Texas started in the mid eighties and um, is only in the last uh, eight or nine years actually gone from an entirely volunteer run organization to one with paid staff. And it's, it's just been um, a terrific ride I'm uh, closing out my fifth year on the board. Um, so what's going on? Why does it matter right now what NAMI Central Texas does? Well, there's the ongoing isolation from COVID, the economic upheaval, people who are have lost their jobs, companies that have downsized. Now the um, rent abatement program is ending. And so it's, it's just the, the economy is not recovering for everyone the way perhaps we had hoped. And, you know, we all hear about the great resignation. And so do I or don't I? Do I stay? Do I deal with it? Do I go out on my own? Do I find something else? Because in theory, everyone is looking for staff. And so the result in anxiety and depression is um, it's no longer just limited to adults either with school children who are still doing virtual learning, who have gone back to class and then back to home, and those who are getting sick and worried about family. It's really just sort of an all-encompassing um, fraught experience these days. So how can NAMI Central Texas help? I mean, just to jump right into it, if you or someone you know and care about or work with or, or partner with a colleague needs some help, whether it's um, fleeting and acute or ongoing and chronic, NAMI Central Texas has all kinds of support and peer groups um, from one-off programs, uh, you know, a, a two-hour presentation that you can attend that's like, okay, here's how I deal with it, here's how I guide them, here's how I know what kind of resources to offer. There are um, classes that you can take to learn, particularly if it's a chronic ongoing um, situation with a, a friend or family member, you know, what are the signals for relapse? How do I personally respond and cope? How do I guide them to cope? Um, are there programs that may be helpful? And all of the programs that NAMI Central Texas offers, all of the resources are free and the ongoing advocacy that we do through NAMI Texas at the state legislature to make sure that um, mental health is treated with the same respect and availability as physical health is a big part of that. So I like to think, um, learning from some of what y'all have said today, that NAMI Central Texas really tries to be agile itself. Uh, understanding that the the need is expanding along with the population growth. It's we renamed last year from NAMI Aust, NAMI uh, Austin to Central Texas because of the ongoing need. The instant and immediate pivot to online and virtual. Nothing was done in person anymore, which meant a lot of our volunteers and staff had to learn something that was very new for them and perhaps uncomfortable. Um, working with law enforcement as the understanding um, is raised that the basically the largest mental health provider in the state of Texas is the judicial system and uh, prisons and jails. And so a lot of folks who end up in an encounter with law enforcement is because they may be having a, a mental health moment. Um, dual programming in Spanish is um, really important. Creating a faith-based programming outreach that some faith communities, um, folks will turn to their pastors and priests um, instead of the health community or the mental health community. And just talking more about 
the fact that mental health care is health care. And if we can desensitize the topic, um, maybe we can work to end the stigma of getting people to ask for help because it's it's a need that more than half of us will have at one point in our life. And more than 20, 25 percent of us at any given moment are living with some sort of mental health issue. So um, why bring it up now? The um, the seasonal change, the holidays, end of year triggers like grief and aloneness and perhaps memories. Um, unfortunately, the Christmas holiday season and end of year is the, the number one period of the year for suicide. Um, the pandemic is ongoing and now we're hearing about spikes in Europe again and, and the ongoing financial and economic concerns that people are facing. You just can't seem to catch a break and you know when is this going to let up and you know what do I do and and then it just really takes a toll on folks so what can y'all do individually um we certainly welcome an end of year gift or a gift in tribute or memory of someone that you know what you know they're struggling and damn it they're just not going to give up and they are maybe a shining light to someone else without realizing it um Check out our website, NAMI Central Text, NAMI Central TX.org for suggestions or help. If you have questions, what do I, you know, how do I recommend to someone what to do or where to go? And if y'all could become ambassadors as well, just, you know, let's talk about mental health, talk about NAMI Central Texas to raise awareness that you know there there is somebody out here who can possibly help let's change that conversation and end the stigma um so as i have just completely sprinted through this conversation wanted to um show you namicentraltx.org is the website i'm the board treasurer uh treasurer at namicentraltx.org if you have any questions if you you know would ever like to be in touch with a person um happy to hang out and answer any questions and just thank you all for giving us a few minutes of platform and quite frankly for for the doodles which i love they help um john they make a a, a somewhat um challenging topic a little easier to understand so thank you for that as well i yeah, know thank you so much jennifer for what you do and what your organization does for our community um, we are so excited to donate all the proceeds to two amazing organizations both nami and the thinkery and as carrie uh, expressed in the chat, we will be sharing those numbers later on today. Thank you. So. And do we just we just really appreciate having the platform to talk more about what we're doing. We're we're starting in the new year uh, a, a concentrated outreach effort into businesses to partner with them to say, you know, if you want somebody to come in and give a staff presentation or something like that, like let's just let's just talk about it. You don't have to admit anything openly, but you know, there is a resource there for you. So thank you for giving us that platform. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you to you, Jennifer. Okay, so next on our agenda, we will be going on another five minute break. That's right. Um, this time I'm gonna not uh, try and do the timer since I messed up last time and instead you get to see the awesome view of our amazing sponsors for today. Um, just know that we'll be back in five minutes. So if you come back at about 10 after the hour, um, we'll be good. All right, so see Let's you see at about soon. 10 after the hour, yeah.
All right. So if everybody's got their tea or coffee, or maybe if it's the afternoon, wherever you are, it's a different kind of beverage. It's five o'clock somewhere, maybe. <laughs> um, all right. So we are ready for our next and third and final speaker. Whoop. And um, as I kind of hinted um, at the beginning that um, we, uh, we will move all of our giveaways to the end. So we've got lots of giveaways. So um, as we bring Sally on, um, I just wanted to share a couple words about Sally with um, all of you. So um, I'm super excited to introduce Sally Alada. I um, got to hear Sally the first time that she spoke at the Business Agility Conference that John was talking about in New York, and I think it was 2018, I think. Um, words that are used to describe Sally include things like thought leader, transformer, coach, trainer, mother, daughter, and software architect. Um, she is the CEO and founder of Agility Health, which is a company dedicated to helping organizations accelerate their enterprise agility transformation journey. She and her team are passionate about delivering real value to their customers and gaining their trust and love. And I love that she, I love love. See, I said it, we'll say the word a lot. I love that she includes that. How cool it is that you hear a CEO include um, gaining trust and love from their, their clients on, on their website in the work that they do. Um, she's a hands-on practitioner, loves seeing the aha moments when individuals, teams, and leaders begin to realize how much more potential they can unlock when, once they understand why work isn't flowing the right way. They keep an open mind to the cultural and personal changes that are needed for success. She, um, something I thought was pretty cool, Sally is also a contributor for PMI's Agile Certified Practitioner Offering. So the PMI ACP, if any of you are familiar with that, she was, she was a contributor for that. Um, she, she believes in making an impact in everything you touch, whether that's for individuals, teams, organizations, or as an agent of social change. And when you hear her share her story, you will see that she leads with her heart in everything she does, whether it's running her company, loving on her three beautiful children, or bringing agility to her home country of Sudan. And as I hear from her team, she's also a fabulous dancer. So hopefully one of these days we'll get back in person, see you at the, the conference again, and get to see, you, see your moves. <laughs> um, so welcome to Sally. Um, we are so excited to have you and to round out our day of daring to be agile. And hopefully we'll see you shortly on our screen and not just me. There we go. Awesome. You have promoted me. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's just like, how do, how do I press this button? I want to be able to show up. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was a really wonderful introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today to tell my personal story. Um, those of you that know me uh, know that normally I'm very comfortable talking about measurement continuous improvement, how do you measure business agility, all these amazing things that um, John and uh, Ahmed shared with you. But Carrie today asked me to be bold and tell my other story, uh, which is my personal journey of making global impact, whether it's on my company side or whether it's my Sudan next generation, my nonprofit. But as you listen to my story, what I hope that you get out of it isn't just, you know, how do you start a company or how do you help a country? I really want you to think about What's your dream? What's that big, bold dream that you might have? And what will it take for you to move that dream forward? And what are you learning from my story and my guts and my courage and all these things that I'm going to share with you um, that can help you do something? And, and that dream might be social. Uh, maybe you care about children. Maybe you care about education. Maybe you care about poverty. Maybe you care about your community. I don't know what drives you, but all of us are driven with something else beyond just 
making companies more profitable. And we do that well with business agility. I think we do. And we've learned so much, you know, how to get teams to be high performing, how to use agile to deliver, you know, better, safer products, happier teams. But I think all of us have so much more uh, that we're capable of doing to make an impact at a, at a bigger level, at a local level, at a community level. So that's going to be my talk with you today. And I hope that you enjoy it. Thank you, Carrie, for uh, inviting me. Let me share my screen. And let me, and that's Sudan next gen. We'll come back to that. Can you see my? Cool. All right. So my leadership model is defined by being bold, being real, and leading with love. And, and I'm going to share with you for those three areas, uh, how did I use that to build Agility Health, which is a well-known company now, very grateful for that. Um, and also the, the launch of Sudan Nexion, which I had not expected to do anything like that. Um, so my, my background, I think Carrie already did a great job. So I'm really not gonna go through too much of it, but I do wanna introduce you to my beautiful family, uh, my husband who has stood by my side through this very long um, journey uh, called life and, and, and helping me through this big dream. Um, I have a beautiful daughter, Yara, uh, she's 16. And then Sharif and Noor are 11 and 12. Um, originally, I come from Sudan in Africa. I moved to the United States in 1995. Um, I've always just come here where I always say I'm, I'm a little girl from Africa who came with the dream of making a global impact. Um, and I came to the United States because I know this is where dreams come true. Uh, and this is where I can be myself and, and move something big like Agility Health or Agile Videos or EBA and now Sudan Next Gen forward. Um, so, so this is my story. Before I start, I like to engage with you in the chat. What traits and beliefs are needed to lead big change? And this could be a business agility, it could be agile, or it could be a big change in your community, or it could be a big nonprofit, or it could be a movement. It doesn't matter. When we say that we want to lead a big change, um, what does that look like? Who do you need to be? How do you need to show up? Courage authenticity, perseverance, trust, big heart, stamina. May says faith, absolutely. Courage, fear of not failing, confidence, confidence that you can do it. You got it, you guys, this is great. Being bold, absolutely. Having a servant's heart, Alexandra, thank you. Uh, Todd says you gotta be purpose-driven. Mortaza says trust. Okay, wonderful. You guys got it. I love it. Uh, the will to fight. <laughs> yes. Cal, my husband's here. That's awesome. Uh, yes, the will to fight for what you believe in. So that's exactly it. Like when you are thinking about leading big change, whether it's internal within the companies that you're in right now, or whether external or whether it's your community, you got to like start to kind of build up yourself. <laughs> you really have to mentally and psychologically be in that space of I can do this, I'm going to do this, and I have to believe that I can. Um, so being bold. Be bold is really being fearless in the pursuit of what sets your soul on fire. And people always ask me, you know, how do you know what are you supposed to be doing? It's what you dream of. It's what you wake up thinking about. And, and all of us sometimes have these dreams, but I think we bury them. We're like, ah, oh, just not now, not now. You know, just don't, don't bother me right now. I'll, I'll get to you later. But there comes a time in your life, and maybe it's not now, maybe it's later, where that dream keeps you up at night, where that vision keeps coming back to you, where that thought of helping, of supporting, of changing your career, of starting a business, of supporting a community, of doing something with children, whatever it is, it, it, it sets your soul on fire. And you just feel like, I, I gotta do it. I, I have to do something about this. Um, and so, you know, that courage doesn't mean that you don't have fear, but it means that you have the courage to move forward and to be bold with it. So my story is that, you know, behind every strong African woman, there's a stronger one. So my mother who lives here with me at home and lives downstairs, I built this house actually so that she can, her and my father, um, rest his soul, can live with me. But she is my driver. She is the person that taught me to be fearless. 
Um, and I want to tell you that part of the story because many of you don't realize the impact that you have on your children in terms of confidence building. And I didn't realize it until I grew up is that it's my mother that has raised me to not be afraid and that you can, whatever you put your set, your heart on Sally, you can achieve it. And there's a difference between um, confidence and ego. So we don't want ego. But we do want confidence. We do want to build confidence for, kin for kids that they can do. Um, they can achieve their goal. They can achieve their vision. Um, so I really give a lot of credit to my mother. She grew up in a small town, a small um, city in Sudan, uh, and, you know, was the first one to go to college in her, uh, in her whole family. Uh, and she graduated with honors and got a master's degree. And then she said, I want to go to Scotland, Scotland, as I used to call it when I lived there in Edinburgh and got her PhD and she took me with her. Um, and so living in Scotland with my mother, uh, just the way she raised me was very different than how I would be raised if I was still living in Sudan with her there. Um, so dream big, uh, start with a big dream, believe in yourself that you can achieve it, um, build a strong team around you because it's very difficult to do something on your own, um, experiment and learn. And you'll see that many of these I've adopted from Agile, from business agility, from, uh, from what we teach within these companies. I've taken some of these practices and adopted them to my own life um, as a way of making this come true. Uh, be fearless, just do it, uh, but do set goals and stay focused. Uh, you do have to have small, incremental, iterative goals that you're trying to achieve. Some of you might not know what the next year looks like, uh, but at least try to identify what the next six months, what the next three months could look like for that goal that you're trying to achieve. When I started my company in 2009, it was the Great Recession. Um, everything was falling apart. Um, I had just um, had, Yara was about, I think five, so Yara was about five or six years old. Um, and then I was pregnant with Sharif. So I had all of the right reasons to say, this is probably not a good time for you to start a company right now, Sally. You know, it's the Great Recession. Everybody's firing everybody. Um, the world of Agile is not going to rescue anybody. I mean, you, you need to stay put. Uh, and I didn't. You know, I really felt like Agile, which the name of the company was Agile Transformation. And you'll hear in a little bit why I changed it. So I hope Jonathan Smart's still here. Um, he says, if you're doing an Agile Transformation, don't. I arrived at that conclusion four years ago when I changed the name of the company, which is I didn't want to be in the business of Agile anymore. I wanted to be in the business of business agility and, and enabling measurement and continuous improvement. So I actually fundamentally changed the name of the company. Um, so, but my bet was agility would actually save companies through the Great Recession and, and having to do more with less. So it was a bet that I made. Um, and, and sometimes it just takes some guts, right? And my initial goal, my initial OKR was uh, make up your salary, whatever your number is right now that you make. Just within the first year, just make sure you're not like losing money, sadly. Like that was my first OKR. Um, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man or woman is not he or she who should not be afraid, but who, who conquers that fear, Nelson Mandela. And so, you know, we know Nelson's done some amazing things in his life. Um, and, and it really took a lot of courage. And again, the fear is there, uh, but it's how you conquer that fear, how you move it forward. And it could be a career change. It could be a new position. Uh, it could be something you want to do for the community. Whatever it is that you've got in your mind right now, you've got fear for moving that thing forward. Uh, but how you triumph over that fear is what really matters and, and what, what measures. Um, our very quick story, when I started the company, we were Agile Transformation. Our whole purpose in life was to consult and train. If you checked out agilevideos.com, agiletraining.com, agile transformation, those are, I was really good at uh, capturing domains pretty early before people even like paid attention to Agile, you know, 12 years ago. So it was just training and consulting. I mean, actually people were not even talking about a transformation at the time. They're like, what is Agile? Can you train us on it? What is Scrum? I mean, that was like the, the that was the conversation happening. So that was the goal. That was all we did. And then after doing so much training and coaching and consulting, um, we started to realize, you know, how are people going to retain this? Because they're, they're hiring more people. There's thousands of people. Not everybody can't go to training. What, what are we going to do to sustain? And so that's where agilevideos.com, not .com, sorry, I just noticed there's a typo, .com uh, was created. And, and so we put out, we have over 300 videos now. But that pivot in the strategy was, one, I wanted to pivot to creating a product that was more sustainable because I felt like training and coaching wasn't sustainable and wasn't scalable. Um, and I wanted to start shifting, and you'll see, into what we call enablement model. Enablement, which is how can we help companies fish 
on their own without constantly needing the consultant to be there to help them. So Agile Videos was my first experiment in building a product. Um, and then in 2014, uh, I was very fortunate to work with Blue Cross Brooks of Nebraska. I worked by the CIO, who's now the COO there, uh, Susan Courtney. I learned so much from her because she allowed me not just to come in and out like most companies do. She allowed our company to work with her for maybe five or six years and honestly do a complete top-down transformation. I'm talking about business, HR, you know, uh, claims department, uh, executive CEO, CFO. It was so fulfilling for me. And going through that opportunity to do a full enterprise business agility transformation, not just agile, made me see clearly that measurement was going to be a problem because we had about 40 to 50 teams. And I, it was very hard for the leaders to hear the voice or understand what the problems were. It was very subjective. Everybody kept saying, well, I think we should do this. Well, the managers say we should do that. The scrum masters want to do this. Uh, but there was no easy way. And so that's where I started to think about, well, we got to work on measurement. And I honestly looked online first. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to find something that we are going to use. And I couldn't find anything that inspired me that looked the way that I wanted it to look and attract executives. So then we built um, Agility Health, which is our measurement platform to solve that problem. I'm telling you the story because we were ahead of the market. Um, 2014, no one was asking about measurement at that time. They're asking now. Everybody now is saying OKRs, you know, qualitative metrics, quantitative metrics. So we're, we're, we're working with so many companies now. But at that time, nobody was thinking about that. And I felt comfortable and confident being ahead of the market and saying, you know, I'm going to anticipate the market's need. And based on my existing knowledge of this market and being in this company and knowing that I have this problem, which is I have 60 teams, 50 teams right now that I can't assess, I need to build something to do that. And even though we're not a, we were not a product development company at the time, we were just a transformation consultancy, I made a very strong pivot for our company to completely uh, shift away from consulting and training ourselves into being an enablement in a product company. And that pivot was important for us. Um, and that was a, a business change. So our company itself was learning and experimenting and pivoting. And of course, um, recently in about 2017, we um, put out the uh, EBA. And it's really funny because the, the, the day that we had our enterprise business agility certification class, which was at the same time that IC Agile released their certification, which was the same week that Evan Laborn published his first article on business agility. It was like, it was like, business agility is born. <laughs> like, I kind of felt like this was like an amazing moment uh, where all of us just without even talking to each other, you know, Evan says he was in a hospital actually, or, or he wasn't feeling too good and he published that article. And then somebody said, well, did you see this, you know, EBA enterprise business agility model? And so we all became very strong friends after that. We were friends before that, but um, that's, that's basically the journey. And I, what I want you to get out of this is just the constant learning and pivoting and inspecting what the market needs and even shifting our business name away from agile transformation to agility health, because enabling business agility, and this was back in 2014, um, was what I felt the market was going to go mm -hmm. towards. So that's the be, that was the be bold part, the be real, um, as a leader, people only trust you if they believe you, you guys believe in that, right? People only trust you if they believe you, if you're speaking from the heart. And so I want to ask you in the chat, when I say think about somebody that's authentic, that's real, who comes to your mind? Give me a public figure that is an authentic public figure that you believe, whether you agree or disagree with them, uh, they speak from the heart. People believe them. Simon Sinek. Great. Who else? Brene Brown. Jennifer. Yes. Brene Brown. Look. Yeah, I love it. Several times. Will Smith, James Clear, Oprah. <laughs> Carrie, you're, you're thinking of my, you're reading my mind. So those are people that speak. Nelson Mandela, absolutely, Sam Harris. Um, those are people that are authentic. They speak from the heart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was thinking like you of Oprah. Um, Alicia Keys, yes, I love it. People that speak from the heart, you believe them, you trust them. And I think that's the most important part of being real is just saying what you want to say from the heart. And if there's something you can't share with people, you just, I, I can't share that information right now. I really want to, I just can't. Um, but not putting that fake face on, you know, that I'm your big boss, you have to report to me, or I got to talk down to you or talk up to you, or, you know, you better respect me. Like just sometimes people that get into leadership positions, they just, um, they put enough fake face 
uh, and they start talking in a different tone and you know presenting themselves. And I think the I, I think the big office gets in their head. Um, and we have that problem, honestly, like in in the Middle East and Africa. You know, when people are promoted, they really do think of leadership as power. Um, and so I have more power over you right now. But um, that's not leadership, right? Maybe that's just management, but it's not leadership. So be if you really want to have people follow you, you need to be real. Um, give real feedback. So Kim Scott, I know many of you guys will probably read this uh, book, which is about radical candor, but I think um, we need to be open and honest with each other and give feedback from a place of love. Uh, through the pandemic, I've had to let go of people. I've had to give very open, honest feedback to people and it hurt so bad, but I gotta do it. I gotta give people feedback from a place of love um, because I want them to be successful. And if they're not successful, I really wish them success in another place, but I'm gonna give them open, honest feedback where, where they stand today and how they're doing. Um, and you do need to share who you are. Uh, some of us uh, have a lot of different layers. Uh, for example, it took me a long time to be comfortable after September 11th being open and honest that I'm a Muslim and that I'm from Sudan. Um, and, and, and one time in one of an executive session that I was part of, it was a very elite executive group. There was about 35 people. They were all C-level executives and, and it was a leadership development workshop. And, and I don't think anybody suspected that I would be a Muslim. So one of them was just talking openly and, and, and honestly about how Islam is like the, the terrorist religion and, and how all Muslims are terrorists and why are we tolerating them? And, and he said so many words and, and somebody like me, I mean, my heart just started to beat so crazy and I didn't know what to do in that moment but there were so many people and we were like sitting in this big u-shape and then you, your heart just starts pounding I'm like oh my god am I going to speak up am I going to say something I, I can't be quiet I'm going to say something I have to say something oh my gosh and I raised my hand while he was speaking and that moment of courage when I just said um I can't remember his name now Hal um Hal stop stop I just said stop and then I had to collect myself and I just obviously cried and bawled for a little bit there. And then everybody was like, oh my gosh, we have a Muslim in the room. Okay, so stop <laughs> what you're saying. We need to hear from Sally. And then they gave me um, they gave me the room so I could say how I felt about what he said. And, and that moment was very difficult for me because it's easy to want to assimilate. It's easy to want to become one with others. It's easy to want to just show up as everybody else and, um, and be friends. But sometimes, you know, sharing who you are and what you stand for and things like that. Um, and we've had so much, you guys, you know, the last two years with COVID, with politics, with Black Lives Matter, with Islam, with what's happening. I mean, we have so much going on in the, in the world right now that all of us have different stance on different things. But how do we show up respectfully and, and say our truth and be real with where we stand? And even if it doesn't have to be in a work setting, you know, how do we be real in the community outside of it? So, so that's just one more thing I wanted to share with you is just that courage to be real and show up as who you are. Uh, and then finally, lead with love. So needless to say, you can't love people without leading them, but you cannot lead people without loving them. So um, I genuinely love the people that work in my company. I genuinely love my customers. I genuinely love all of you here. If I could ever help or support any of you, I, I just lead from a place of what can I do to help? How can I support being empathetic, caring about people um, from the heart, you know, not in a fake way, because some people say they lead from love. And um, some of the pictures that make me happy was like this picture in front of our culture wall, where we did this extravaganza week um, back when we could all get together and, and people flew from all around the world. And uh, we had, you know, remote workers and, and they all came into Omaha and we just spent a week just having fun, getting to know each other. Um, this wall that you see behind us really means a lot to me. It's our cultural wall. Uh, we, we built it together. We all brainstormed as a team. Why do we want to work here? What makes uh, Agility Health um, a place that would make us happy? And that wall was right in the middle of our office. And I'm really sad, obviously, now it's not there anymore because we've downsized. But um, it stays in our heart and it stays in our background. So many of us have it as our background and our screens now that we work remotely. But um, being servant leaders at heart, being thought leaders in our industry, uh, living by humble, hungry, smart, working as one team, lifting each other up, uh, positive energy. I am allergic to negativity. If people say we can't do this, this will not happen. This is impossible. Um, it's like, like, oh, OK, <laughs> you just stepped on it, didn't you? Uh, positive energy, because I always say, you know, if a little girl from Sudan can come here and build this dream, anything is possible. We just have to figure out how, how do we do it? 
Um, so, so make sure as you guys, you know, build your culture now that you're all remotely, think about these things. What are your anchors? What are so important to you that you don't want to negotiate on? Um, planting seeds, not planting weeds was very much a big anchor for us and it still is. Uh, planting seeds, meaning telling positive stories about each other and not planting weeds and telling negative stories or trying to undermine each other with each other. Um, staying above the line, below the line. There's a wonderful video. Jenny, if you're here, if you can post it, it's called Conscious Leadership. Uh, we play that video during onboarding. Everybody in the company has watched that video, which is how do you stay above the line versus below the line. We live, live by that video. So um, just create some anchors from a cultural perspective that really help you understand who you are and, and, and hire the right people. And honestly, let go of the people that don't fit this culture. Almost everybody we've ever had to let go of, with the exception of COVID, when we had to downsize, really it was something related to this cultural wall. Last thing I wanna talk about related to my journey on Agility Health, and then I'm gonna to switch to Sudan Next Gen is leading with love is very difficult during crisis. Um, the pandemic wasn't easy on our company or any company. And we had financial challenges. We had expense reductions. We had to do layoffs for the first time in me running this company for 12 years now, you know, so proud that we were growing and getting to the size and everybody was happy. I had to cut and lay off people and that hurt my heart so much. Um, people have fear and anxiety, stress. They take it out on each other. There's conflict, there's finger pointing. But I think what you learn through all of that as a leader is persistence and resilience. Those two words, right? Persistence and resilience. And I totally feel 100% that we are a stronger company now than what we were before COVID and before all of these things that had to happen to us. We're stronger as a people. We're stronger. I'm a stronger leader. I'm surrounded by stronger leaders in my team. Individuals are stronger. Um, we have crossed, you know, we've, we've, we've made it. <laughs> we've made it, we survived um, and, and we did it together as a team. So, so, you know, take these opportunities when there is a crisis to still lead, lead with love. Don't fall back into command and control and fear because your people will be stronger because of it. Uh, never let a, a serious crisis go to waste. It's an opportunity to do things that you thought could be um, impossible before. So make sure you respond versus react. Um, I'm gonna just end with, these are amazing customers. And why am I showing you? This is not a show off slide. I just want you to know that how I measure success is all of these amazing companies around the world that have trusted us now. I mean, I just I just had a meeting with you know the Federal Reserve this week and I'm about to go present for this, the CEO of City. Those little things that companies love us and trust us and know who we are and believe in our vision um, means the world to me. And if I, again, I'm just an individual here that had a dream, can build something that becomes, has a global impact, you know, all these amazing companies are leveraging it, whether it's NASA or Bank of America or Bloomberg, I'm very proud of all of them. Um, that's what it took. All those things I just shared with you is what it took for me to be here today and say I'm so proud um, that, that many of these are customers and that they trust us and, and, and believe in our vision around measurement and continuous improvement. So um, any questions about my company and all of that, go ahead and post it. Uh, Carrie, how much more time do I have for the Sudan part? I want to make sure I speak fast if I need to. Um, I, you have uh, almost 10 minutes. 10 Not minutes, quite, okay. Um, yeah. No. Yeah, I will go quickly. Yeah. So the Sudan story, in the middle of all this, all the stuff I just told you, Sudan lights up on fire. A revolution erupts in Sudan, like a real revolution. Uh, like, you know, what we used to watch several years ago that was happening in Egypt and Tunisia and Algeria, countries, millions of people are coming out and saying, we want democracy. We don't want this dictatorship anymore. We want our freedom. We're done with military rule. Um, and, and the images that were coming from Sudan were like, you just couldn't ignore it. You know, you just couldn't ignore um, what was happening. And then women were leading the charge. You know, a lot of Sudanese women were standing up there. And this picture on the left side is like super popular right now. It's almost like our, you know, um, uh, our freedom uh, image. And she was, she really became a, a sort of a beacon of this is what it looks like. She's the revolution icon. So I got involved. Um, people were basically shouting on the streets, freedom, justice, and peace, and, and, and no to dictatorship anymore. And they wanted to get rid of al-Bashir. He was a 30-year dictator. Um, these were the images that we kept seeing. I mean, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of people 
peacefully. The one thing that they have learned from all the other revolutions that happened in the Middle East is once it becomes violent, they come on you. They start to just kill you masses. So they all stay peaceful. Even when they try to give them weapons, they stay peacefully. Um, just for those of you that are new to Sudan, I'm just going to tell you a very quick story here of what's been happening in Sudan. Um, when al-Bashir took power uh, in 1989, 30 years ago, one of the first things that he did is he executed 28 of the top um, generals in, in the military. My father was number 29. So he actually had 30 on the list. Why did I come to the United States? I came through political asylum because of my father's story. That's the tie here, is that my father was against the old regime. He was one of the, the folks that supported the democratic regime before it. And he was one of the folks that was um, supposed to be executed, but he was able to get out. And so all I did growing up is I learned from my father how dictatorship sucks and we need democracy back and that we need we need um, to get rid of al-Bashir. I didn't really pay attention to all of it because I was young. And I did not know that I myself would, you know, be part of the story later. Um, we got added to, you know, he he was um, charged by the ICC. We got added to the state sponsored terrorist list because bin Laden had to go visit us and live there for several years. Um, people erupted recently in 2018 and said freedom, justice and peace. Good news is that um, we the, the, the Sudanese protesters peacefully were able to take down al-Bashir's government. So he's now in jail. Uh, we were able to elect a new prime minister, um, and he has been doing an amazing job. His name is Prime Minister Hamdok, and he actually removed Sudan from the state-sponsored terrorist, and he did so much to turn the country around again um, in the last two years since he's been in the transitional government. Last month, I'm talking about one week ago, um, a, a military coup happened in Sudan again. We've been all over the news, for those of you that have been watching it. So the military that said it was going to partner with, Burha, with uh, Hamdok actually took over the government and now put him in jail. Well, not jail, house arrest. So we're in a very difficult situation right now, so please pray for Sudan. But I just want you to see how a country transforms from happy, sad, bad, good, up and down. And so what do we do? What do you do? How do you help? Um, I started uh, back in May of 2019, I created this little video, I put up a flip chart <laughs> and post-it notes and a marker. And I said, Sudan next gen, here's my vision. I think we should unite all of our diaspora people outside of the country to help Sudan. What do you guys think? Here's the three things I think we should do. It was that little video that went viral. It was just a video, you guys, it was just a video. And I published it on our Facebook page and the video went viral. Um, and we have now over 142,000 people following us on our Facebook Sudan Next Gen page. Um, and then I got asked to come and speak on Al Jazeera, uh, which is a very popular channel for the Middle East. And these two videos, one was in front of the Congress, had 1.2 million views, and another one that was on the Jazeera had 1.3 million views. All of a sudden, with no planning, with no intention, I became a public figure for the revolution for Sudan and a lot of people were following and saying, what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? And I'm like, oh, wow, hey, hold on. I am, you know, I'm, a, I'm an agile transformation leader, um, but what can we do? And so we built, um, what I know how to do is I know how to build platforms. So we built a platform called Sudan Next Gen um, as a way of organizing the work of the diaspora, people outside of Sudan to help Sudan. We registered, 522 experts from around the world that want to help Sudan. We had them all register. Think about LinkedIn for Sudan. So if I wanna know who are the Sudanese that are willing to help the country, even at no cost, that's where you would go. Uh, we had all of the people that have projects and ideas because everybody after the transitional government says, we should do this, we should do this, we can do that, we can do that. And they were sending me all their ideas. And I'm like, hey, I'm gonna give you guys a public database where you can register all these development projects for Sudan. So 200 are there right now. Um, we went and trained 2,300 people in Sudan. I had an amazing group of trainers go to Sudan um, and, and, and do this training. And May is actually on this call with us here. And we brought Agile. So the Agile transformation in Sudan has started, but I wanna tell you something so amazing. Nobody in Sudan knows that Agile was built for IT or for technology. We don't even use it as an example. Agile in Sudan is known to be a way of teams to work together to achieve goals in small increments. And most of the teams that use it in Sudan are nonprofit civil society teams, um, healthcare workers. It has not even infiltrated the technology side yet. I mean, like how awesome is that you guys? 
nothing. That whole, well, how does this work for us? Because it came up in IT, that's like not even there. It's not even part of the conversation. All of the teams that we've enabled are non-technology teams. This is one of the workshops that we delivered with 400 people attending to learn Agile. And these are people in that workshop using post-it notes and stickies to learn how to plan. Um, we found there's like 30 to 40 other nonprofits. We pulled them together. We taught them how to use Trello boards to organize their work in the coalition um, to combat COVID. Uh, to to deliver healthcare needs in Sudan right now. Um, and there's so much happening right now. Uh, we built an e-learning platform with lots of videos that people can watch. So I had to teach Agile in Arabic. Um, and I did meet the prime minister uh, in person and uh, took a picture with him when he was here in DC. And I hope that they release him soon. They might release him today or tomorrow uh, from his house arrest. Uh, our latest and greatest thing that we were about to start in December was digital jobs. We were going to train and certify. Um, thank you to the Scrum Alliance for giving us free Scrum Master certification. Uh, we were going to train 50, 50, 50 people, graduate young men and women, and give them jobs within Sudan and in the future through Africa Next Gen. I've partnered with Anu, uh, who owns Africa Agility. And um, uh, Africa Agility and Sudan Next Gen created Africa Next Gen, where we hope that all of you and companies around the world will hire talented African employees uh, to work digitally and to work online with you. So that's our next vision. Unfortunately, all of that got stopped last week when Burhan decided to take over the government. So this is me exactly last Sunday, Saturday, standing in front of the White House, standing in front of Congress, um, and being very loud as I always am to say, bring back our civilian government. Uh, this ends my conversation, my, my presentation today. What I just wanted to leave you with is, you know, our skills as change leaders are transferable, but you have to believe in yourself. Um, I have this bracelet that I wore for a long time, and I still have the, the sign here with me, um, and it's called, you know, she believed she could, so she did. Um, if you're trying to make something very big happen, you have to first believe that you can and that it will, and faith is very important, and then you just keep going. You take one step at a time um, and continue to test it, nail it before you scale it, like pivot. Um, that's my story. I really hope you enjoyed it. I will pause and take any questions or feedback. Oh, Sally, we so, so, so love having you here. Um, if, if you do have questions for Sally, um, put them in chat. If anybody has anything um, we'll pause for just a moment. Um, so yes, yeah, so inspiring, Sally. So love, love hearing your story. And um, so thankful that you were here today with us because I feel I like your story it. kind of it it tells that 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 dare to be, be bold um in whatever we do. And then I I super love the leading, leading with love. It's just thank you very much she, for inviting yeah. me. I normally don't go to that story. I normally talk about <laughs> measurement, continuous improvement. But when Carrie said, no, I want the personal story, I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Because <laughs> it always takes courage, you guys, to talk about this stuff. So, uh, but that's what you should do. You know, you should be bold and have the courage to tell your, bring up your real self. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks again for inviting me. It was an amazing um, session today. I hope all of you guys learned a ton about business agility and, and agile and also being bold and being real. Thank you so much again for the invitation. Yeah, thank you, Sally. Thank you, thank you. All right, we are wrapping up our conference and that means giveaway time. So um, we have three more giveaways to do and Max is here to do the spinning wheel of excitement for all of our um, participants. So, um, all right, Max. Oh, um, I'm gonna not show my slides so that you can show your wheel. Uh, but for everyone to know, oh, we've got the Sooner, Safer, Happier book. Sally is offering a seat at the Agility Health Facilitator Certification course. Um, and we have a second Hyperdrive CSM or CSPO course. Whoop, whoop. Whoop. Three giveaways. I Three. Know. So exciting. Man. It's like the holidays. It's like Christmas. It Woo. totally is. <laughs> um, okay, Max. So I you did. bring up your wheel of names and let's see if we do how many spins we need. We, we will say must be present to win, please. And the first yes. one is John's book, Sooner, Safer, Happier. All right. Are we ready, folks? Back by popular demand. Wheel of <laughs> names. And yeah, we're we clicking. Will. All right. Lenny and 
Mustafa cannot win. There are two people oh, that cannot right. win. I removed them already. You've already won something. You can't win again. You, we got to yeah, share. You can't win twice. Uh, Chad Crutchett. Is He's here. Chad here. He's Chad here. Okay. here. One is gone. Congratulations, Chad. Chad Just you by are, showing up. That's right. Proud owner of John's book. And we're writing all this down. So mm-hmm. have no fear. Um, okay, we'll reach out. All right, all right. And uh, we're going to do our is... next one. And drum roll. And the next one name. is a seat at um, Agility Health Facilitator Certification Course. <gasps> um, a seat for the Ingrid, Ingrid Jones. Yes, she's here. Oh, wait. Oh, people are here. They're still here. Way to go, Ingrid. Feel free to chat in there where you're joining from. Say something about yourself as a winner. And you're welcome. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Okay, so. now our third, our third um, exciting uh, giveaway is from Hyperdrive. I think Stacy Louie is still here with us. He's from Hyperdrive, and they have generously offered um, two. The, so this will be the second one, um, a seat at either the upcoming CSM or CSPO course offered by his company. A whole seat for the full training. Thank exactly. you, Hyperdrive. That's right. Last but not least, we're going to roll. We need music. And we <laughs> have as a winner, if he or she is attending, who is it, Isaac? Isaac, Isaac. Linkletter. Are you here, Isaac? He is not. Oh, Ooh. poor Isaac. Poor Isaac. Isaac, you're not here. So that again. means... There's again. somebody again. else that can win. Let's do it. Let's do it. Have to be here to win. Last giveaway. And we have. Is it. Who's jo- it going to be? Joju Quejada? Is Joju here? Mm. No. 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 We're nope. going to remove Joju and we're going to do it again. Third, 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 third time's a charm. Third time's a charm. Third charm. <laughs> charm we're doing it we're doing it oh thank you everyone for being so patient with us and oh, is it jonathan no it's it's kayla, kayla. Orn. i don't and see a kayla, kayla oh, wow. is no not here oh we okay, were fourth one. <laughs> before now all of a sudden max work on your spinning ab- abilities I, I'm, I'm working i'm working i'll do a retrospective all right after this on that stacy Bryan. yes stacy Stacey Stacey Bryan, who i actually know stacy mm-hmm. Bryan. stacy Bryan. Here. i don't see stacy Bryan. nope stacy was Ooh. here okay. Uh, okay one more and then we're one we're, more one i'll more. just pick a number on the spreadsheet is what i'll do <laughs> <laughs> Today's attendance uh, was at one. Let's see if we got this. If we got this. Oh, oh, oh. Jeffrey yeah. Hall. Oh, he was here earlier. Oh, well, okay. Jeffrey, no. No, 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 no. We said you Max. have to be here to win. You have to be here. So, yep. Okay, folks, Max. Uh, we don't have enough time. And uh, this do it, will do be it one more. One more. One more. And then one, the more. one more. Okay. <laughs> and then maybe if that person's not here, the person above or below. Maybe. Yes, yes. That's okay, right. I like that. Yeah. So we have, we We're have, uh, Janaka. Oh, it's too fast. Yes, that person's here. Shalak. Shalak. Can you say your name right? Please correct yeah. us if we did not. Shalak, yeah. yeah, he's here. Yeah. And everything. He or yeah. she is here. That's sure. Congratulations. Lucky. Okay. After three um, times, we missed it. Thank shoot, you. I, I would like to say <laughs> very quickly before I leave shout out to Cassandra and Carrie. And Steve was not here for coordinating this fabulous Keep Austin Agile conference. It's been Thank such a huge you. success. Thank you. A lot of work and much appreciation of love. Stay yeah. Thank you, Max. Stay Thank agile. you, Max. And we also want to give a big shout out to our three amazing speakers who totally just made today inspiring and daring. Um, I just, I took so many notes and I um, can't wait to keep processing and see where we go from there. So thank you, Ahmed, John, and Sally for being a part of our conference this year, made it just amazing. Uh, We also would like to say thank you to our sponsors. So WellSky um, as our title sponsor, Eliasing Group and Hyperdrive, and then IC Agile for our sponsors. 
um, our giveaway sponsor. We're so appreciative for all four of you um, for helping to make this happen. And then finally, last but not least, thank you to all of you um, for being here with us today because your attendance is what makes us so great. Um, and then finally, based on the feedback that we got from last time, um, there was a lot of interest from folks who wanted to stick around after the conference and get to know each other. So Cassandra, oh, oh, and we have a feedback form. Wow. We do, we do. So we value your feedback. We wanna make next year's conference even better. So please take a few moments to just fill out the feedback form that I just dropped in the chat. Thank we you. We would really appreciate that. No worries, Carrie. Awesome. And then last but not least, if you're interested in sticking around for um, the networking uh, session, 30 minutes, bring your lunch, bring a drink, just hang out to chat about the cool things that you heard about today. Um, we will do that on a separate Zoom channel so that you can all actually see each other versus the webinar where it's very much feels a little more one way. So um, Cassandra is going to put that information in the chat. If you're interested in joining us for the networking lunch, we'll see you over on that Zoom. Thank you again to everyone. Hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Yes, thank you all. Yeah. I feel like we need a, I think I've got a happy trip. <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah, so, so I know that as soon as I close the session, um, people won't have access to the chat. So I do wanna let, uh, everyone know that you should have received this um, networking Zoom meeting in your email this morning. A little closing time. Thank you all. <laughs> time, Carrie needs lessons on how to share her timer better. I'll be ending this meeting, Carrie. Okay, perfect. See you all on the networking.